beautiful toy flying you know it's eagle right this toy is made up of uh, password materials so that is an indicator and how do we look at the phosphorescence we know already basics of the phosphorescence let's recall our uh, jablonski diagram where we discuss about the all these photophysical processes and we studied about the absorption and leading to the excitation of the molecule fluorescence which is a radiative relaxation from the singlet state you have an intersystem crossing to the triplet state and from the triplet you can have a radiative and non radiative so now we are focusing ourselves on the radiative process which is called as a phosphorescence so there is our interest now we know already what is a triplet state to recall again uh, it is the difference in the orientation of the electrons now look at the ground state which is a singlet state let us say and when you excite it one of the electron goes to the higher energy level which is called the higher singlet state now only difference is uh, the electron orientation is opposite here in the singlet excited state and we are always uh, comparing it to the ground state orientation of the electron don't think there is always fixed if it changes that will also change that is how you can see the singlet orientation now you have a, an intersystem crossing you have an intersystem crossing and in this process the electron orientation changes that's the reason why you have a time delay in this process and your electron is, is almost the same as the what you have in the other electron in the ground state that is what we call it as a triplet orientation otherwise two uncoded electrons spin multiplicity is three and from this state your electron is going to relax to the ground state and that is a radiative process we are focusing ourselves so you have the spin triplet relaxing to the ground singular state and that is what is called as a radiative phenomenon and we call it as a phosphorescence now this phosphorescence now what is the difference you know we already studied basics of the fluorescence and also fundamentals of the phosphorescence now if you carefully recall in terms of uh, time phosphorescence is slower then the fluorescence because you know fluorescence always happens in nanosecond time scale whereas phosphorescence can start from the microseconds it go on up to few seconds there are a lot of inorganic phosphor materials even 24 hour phosphor materials also available now if you look at the disappearance fluorescence disappears after the removal of the source you know you keep light it expose the material to the light and as long as the light is available you can see the fluorescence after removing the light fluorescence will disappear whereas in the case of phosphorescence you continue to have the luminescence out of the material even after the removal of the source that is what is an interesting property of the material now if you look at the relaxation and the spin states we already you know discussed in the previous projection relaxation in the case of uh, fluorescence is between the singlet states singlet spin states whereas in the case of the phosphorescence it is between the triplet excited state and the ground singlet state otherwise they are between the two different not necessarily always a triplet to singlet you know as long as you take the organic chromophore so you will always end up in a singlet triplet if you go for inorganic chromophores you may have a different spin multiplicities and that's the reason why i carefully mentioned it's between two different spin states and energy of the phosphorus if you look at the energy of the phosphorescence we know the energy gap between the triplet and singlet is lower than the energy gap between the 
S1 and S0. So the energy of the phosphorescence is lower than the fluorescence. This is what we know about the basics of the phosphorescence and we compare it with the fluorescence. So with this uh, basic property of the phosphorescence, now we have to look at how do we measure the phosphorescence. And this is what is an interesting requirement for us. Right. So what do you need? As I already mentioned, you need, can you measure the phosphorescence in a spectrofluorimeter? Yes, in principle, yes, you can do that. Not only principle, you also do that. But you call uh, as a phosphorimeter. And what is phosphorimeter? It is the same as spectrofluorimeter, but with little bit of modification in your sample holders. There will be a you know, if you look at the fluorimeters, you will see two modes available. One is called as a fluorescence mode, the other one is the phosphorescence mode. When you switch to the phosphorescence mode, these devices will get activated. So what is this actually? You have a rotating shutter actually. So you will see a mechanical shutter in front of the light source and also in front of the detector. So that is basically called as a a rotating shutter is basically called as a phosphoroscope and this is a new nomen. So we don't uh, use the same uh, sample detection system as we use for the fluorimeter. It is slightly different. It's a uh, modified. And a second point is normally phosphorescent. This is all uh, in the olden days how people have been doing it. Now people know how to make the phosphorescence to occur at room temperature. There are some molecule also showing a room temperature phosphorescence. One of the very early molecule known in literature is a biacetyl. Biacetyl as the fluorescence as well as the phosphorescence. You can do a room temperature phosphorescence also with biacetyl. It all depends on how much is the thermal reactivation. If thermal reactivation is lower, you can normally see the phosphorescence at room temperature also. So these are the two requirements when you want to measure the phosphorescence. So when you can fulfill these two requirements, you can measure the phosphorescence in your spectrofluorimeter itself. But still the combination of the, the device, shutter devices, and you call them as the phosphorimeter. Now, if you have a current day machines, you know, they don't use any more uh, mechanical shutters. They go for a, uh, you know, modified electronics, which can really pulse your lamps. See, the shutter's job is to work like a, you know, pulsing device. So that is being replaced with a pulse lamp. And uh, for the detector side, uh, you, they replace the detector instead of the, sorry, they replace the shutter. Instead of the mechanical shutter, they get the detector also. These are the electronic, you know, new electronics are developed. Now the current day machines uh, mostly use a, either a combination of a shutter and gating or a pulse lamp and gating. That is the scenario of the phosphorimeters. So this is, if you have this feature in your spectrofluorimeter, it is possible to measure the phosphorescence. So what are the parameters you can think, you know, as we have done the spectrum for fluorescence, you can do a phosphorescence spectrum as we have done the phosphorescence, uh, Quantum efficiency, yes, you can do the quantum efficiency. You can also measure the phosphorescence lifetime right into the spectrofluorimeter, otherwise right into the phosphorimeter. Now, but you have a limitation, how much is the time? You know, normally you can measure the time starting from few milliseconds to seconds, it is possible. Uh, in a phosphorimeter that you have currently available on commercial phosphorimeter, otherwise commercial spectrofluorimeters with the phosphorescence accessory they call it. So this is what is the setup. You should also have the provision to cool down the temperature if you want to go for a low temperature phosphorescence. So if you have that in your spectrofluorimeter, yes, you can measure the entire phosphorescence properties right using your spectrofluorimeter. That setup is called as a phosphorimeter.
Now, if you look at, you know, how they have done this, you know, earlier olden days, the Becquerel was the first guy who gave an idea of the phosphor. He devised the phosphoroscope. He was the first guy to devise a, a methodology to measure the phosphorescence. He did it in the year of 1857. So it's called as a, his name is Alexander Edmund Becquerel. So the device he made it is called as a phosphoroscope. Now let us see what kind of a, a phosphoroscope he has designed it, how he has used it to measure the phosphorescence. Quite a long time back, you know, you see that that's what is interesting. Now initially he designed a rotating disc type of phosphorescence. So you will see a two disc with a slot. Now you can have a four slots or you can have one slots or two slots depending upon your requirements. You will have the two plates like this with the channels, uh, four channel or two channel or one channel. Now they always, uh, you know, keep a positional difference, geometry difference. They don't have the same opening opening. Maybe opening is aligned with the closure. That is what is requirement. You expose light and move it and then see what is the phosphorescence happening, how exactly, what is the decay process, how long luminescence that happens. So the shutter will be rotating, you know, it's rotating with a constant speed or now you can rotate with a variable speed. These are the availabilities. So you have basically, he has basically made a rotating disc phosphoroscope initially with the holes on both the plates that you used it. The second one is called the rotating can phosphor. It is like a, you know, it's like a Coca-Cola bottle. You can imagine it like a can, you know, you make a holes in the both the sides, opposite sides and keep rotating the, rotating your uh, can, you know, then you can see that light is exposed and then, uh, you know, made to dark like that also he was doing it, but it will symmetrically opening and then darkening it. That's how it is detecting. It's called as a <coughs> can phosphoroscope and you can, uh, here in the case of uh, this phosphoroscope, you always keep the sample in the middle actually. <coughs> Whereas in the can phosphoroscope, you keep the sample, uh, one of the sides of the, <clears throat> or your can. So now you can see this, uh, this as an advantage over the disc type, you know, it works much faster. You can have a higher speed uh, and also you can have the reduced interference from fluorescence and other scattering. This is important. Whenever you measure the phosphorescence, you make sure uh, fluorescence is all sometimes you know you will get both but you can differentiate them because their wavelength positions are different but sometimes you know there will be overlap between the fluorescence that will interfere with your phosphorescence measurement also that is the reason why you should make sure all the You should make sure all your uh, fluorescence are filtered when you are measuring the so they're all joining late uh, i keep changing from screen and then you have a problem with my okay fine now you see that when you have the rotating can you can go for a high speed and which can reduce your fluorescence interference with your phosphorescence. Now, what did, if you look at the details of CAN phosphoroscope, it is basically consisting of a hollow cylinder and one or more slits which are equally spaced on the circumference. And this is rotated by a variable speed motor. You can have the variable speed motor so that it can rotate with a variable speed. And rotating can is can be rotated by a motor and the sample is illuminated and the light is darker. Now you can see that sample is illuminated and then it is darkening it. Now you start collecting the data from the sample. That is how the, that is the logic behind this. Whenever there is a dark phosphorescent radiation passes to the monochromator and measured. So this is a simple way of doing it. Now you can think of a small, you know, these are all like a, if you go to a drama show, they put a, you know, to show the face different colors and they put a disc with a different circles with the different colors of the sheet so that they rotate it 
that shows you different color on your face to really add a color to the emotions of the person that is how they can really do it is similar logic and this kind of a disc we also discussed in the case of the filter disc or neutral density filter disc also you can see that that kind of disc we have discussed about it so you put a disc in front of the light you can see that there is an on and off cycle of the light coming it's like a pulse generation from a continuously glowing light source if you want to generate a pulse light source so either you do put a small shutter in front of it with the opening and when the light is in line with the light lamp and then you'll see the light is passing rest of the time it will be closed so that is how you generate a pulse so you have a timing you know frequency of the pulse is based on how fast you are rotating it and pulse width is dependent on what is the width of the opening that you make it so how long the light goes up so that is how they decide you are pulsing of the sources making use of this kind of a phosphorus scope so there are two phosphorus scope they have designed it one is called as a disc phosphorus scope the other is called as a can phosphorus scope now you see how they have used it and they have a this is what is the device can phosphorus scope now you can have the uh, you know light coming up and then falling on the sample the the tube that i am using it is a sample tube you cannot use a normal cuvette that you are, you are used in a fluorimeter because you have to put it a liquid nitrogen uh, when you pull it you know what's the temperature it is 77 kelvin you reach so you have to normally put a thick wall and completely you know no joints if you make a joints it will crack actually when you anneal it to a lower to a room temperature you know any two annealing two three times it will break so you have to have a molded tube without any joints so it is like a blown up like a narrow cylinder when it will have a thick wall uh, quartz tube and this will give you a feature to cool down the temperature and also you can see that light is falling on the sample through the openings and then measuring it so this is the design he has made it to look at the phosphorescence now this is what is the chopper i was saying about it you can also use the choppers to look at the the choppers are like this you can have a chopper to chop the light and make a pulses or you can have the single single chopper you can have it or you have a combination of uh, two choppers this is possible you can have the chopping in exciting light source or you can have a chopping on the emission light source if you make a chopping on the excitation light source you generate a pulse of the light you can see that the pulse of light is coming up and when this becomes darker you can see that this is um, started measuring it now luminescence will decay right in this time it will get it in this so you can get the detector using a disc also so pulse the light source and get the detector this is possible with the two discs that you can use it these are the current day machines so they are really made a lot of modifications now alternatively you can think of a chopper and a gating so they also make a one side is it is a chopper now if you see the hitachi spectrofluorimeters they make use of uh, one type one side chopping and then they have the gating to the detector so when you gate it you can measure the luminescence in the particular window so they don't as it is decaying it they will integrate over this time they don't take a single point measurement they integrate over that window and then with reference to time how exactly luminescence decays that is what is the nice way now look at this when i do this uh, chopping with the mechanical chopping excitation i get a pulse of light and then the sample gets excited and you see a phosphorescence before the next opening comes in phosphorescence decays now i set up a window time window to get power, to get the detector so this is the time window i'm setting it up in this i measure the phosphorescence over a long period right you can start from milliseconds go on up to the a few seconds so that is the simple logic of making use of a mechanical choppers and then electronic gating this is another way of doing it ultimately the principle is the same how you are doing it is differing now the some of the new machines you know they go for a pulse lamp instead of you know chopping it in front of the 
uh, light source so they make a, they give another light separate light source for phosphorus measurements it's a, it's by itself is a pulse lamp some of them they pulse the even the existing lamp you know when you keep pulsing it life will life of the lamp may go down that is the purpose for which they give a separate lamp and you can see the pulse of a lamp you know electronically you can pulse the lamp once you have the pulse lamp and it disappears intensity then you start measuring your phosphorescence and before the next uh, uh, lamp pulse comes in so you can really see how exact you can delay all these things you can adjust the spacing between the pulses you can adjust the pulse weight you can adjust the gate uh, of measurement all these are possible so that gives you a lot of flexibility to measure the phosphorescence parameters so this is the basic logic of a phosphoroscope from the old uh, methodology of uh, phosphoroscope and to the current state of affairs on the spectrofluorimeters how exactly one measure the phosphorescence these are the you know updates that happen on the instrumentation which really facilitates now another next level that you should understand is how to prepare the samples for the phosphorescence measurements in a phosphorescence sample preparation is important and as you know that the fluorescence is also you know a little tricky we discussed about it you need to have the clean uh, quartz quartz and all the condition that we discussed low concentration they are all important requirement but phosphorescence is much more because you are going to handle the material for a lower temperature so this is very important so and most most important is phosphorescence is, is weaker emission when compared to the fluorescence but not always you know there are some molecules uh, like a benzophenone you know it has the almost like a phosphorescence quantum efficiency of 1 but generally pass when you have the fluorescence in your material you may have the phosphorescence you may not have the phosphorescence if you have the phosphorescence quantum efficiency of the phosphorescence will always be lower than the fluorescence quantum efficiency you generally see that for that weak measurement you have to follow stringent conditions so you have to really prepare the sample such a way that uh, you maximize the output of the emission from your sample and then you are recording it the sample should be dissolved in a solvent you know here is an interesting aspect and also important aspect one has to look at it when you normally you take a solvent when you freeze it and it becomes uh, opaque it is not transparent now you can see this if you take water you freeze it it becomes ice now water is colorless when you take the ice cube it is opaque you know it appears white Uh, material that this is very uh, important to note when you take a solvent it should form a colorless and also transparent glass that is very important so that that will not happen with all the solvents that is very important the choice of the solvent is also important here when you go for the 77 kelvin measurement so you call them as lnt temperature liquid nitrogen temperature so cryogenic conditions are usually used because why do we use this because we want to really reduce the background interferences from the fluorescence and the other phenomenons and also the low background from the solvent you know if you have impurities from the solvent that will also reduce it so the cryogenic conditions will give you almost like a background free phosphorescence now when you go for the solvent what kind of a solvent you will think of you cannot use water basically water will give you opaque uh, glassy material right so what kind of a something is a problem now you should have a transparent glass so where you can have the rigid glasses now you can normally introduce uh, glasses now if you look at uh, ethanol ethanol is always used for the polar solvents and the epa which is called as a mixture of uh, three solvents which is used for the non polar samples 
Now EPA is a mixture of a diethyl ether, isopentane and ethanol in the ratio of 5 is to 5 is to 2. And this is what is called as a, uh, it, it is basically a gloss, you know, it is uh, giving you a glossy appearance. Once you freeze it, you can try it. You know, if you have liquid nitrogen in your lab, you can try this. They it will give you a nice uh, glass type of uh, material. And that is the reason why the solvent is selected. Now, you can also have the other solvents available in addition to this EPA. EPA mostly dissolves for the most of the non-polar samples. They use the EPA for polar if you have ethanol. Suppose if you have difficulty of dissolving it, then you can think of alternate solvents. There are a number of solvents available for phosphorimetry, ethanol, methyl mixtures, isopropyl alcohol, isopentane. So you have a table which can give you the the details of the solvents and also the ratios in which they have to be mixed and use it for the low temperature glass. So you call them, you know, EPA, you basically call it like an EPA glass. You know, it is basically the solvent used for most of these phosphorescent measurements. Now, the next is the sample holder. You know, I already mentioned about it when we're discussing about the phosphoroscope. Becquerel phosphoroscope. Now you can see that the sample tube is in the center and you have a liquid nitrogen holder. You call them as a DIVAR assembly. DIVAR is a basically it's a silver coated and uh, you will see that the heat is it is a vacuumized so that you don't lose the heat of it. And bottom will be transparent and the top will be silver coated because the light has to go inside and fall on the sample, right? So this is how they insert the tube. You know, when you insert the tube, you have to insert very slowly because uh, you are inserting the tube from a room temperature and what is inside liquid nitrogen is 77 Kelvin. If you insert faster, immediately liquid nitrogen will bump off. So you have to insert. It's kind of a thermal cooling slowly it should happen. And once you reach the bottom, you can uh, leave it in your uh, spectrometer measure it after some time they attain the temperature you will see a freezing action and glass formation and then you can start measuring it so I given you a picture here which is the uh, side view of this you can see the silver coat silver mirroring and then this is the top view of it so you have to insert this tube in this top and then use it for measurement so the sample tube is a quartz material and DIVAR assembly is also made up of quartz, so one has to be careful. DIVAR is uh, uh, important here. Without DIVAR, you cannot measure the low temperature uh, pass frozen measurements. So many times, you know, I have seen it, our own students are breaking the sample tube very easily, just like that, and they will break it, but they don't know the pain of uh, buying it. But uh, you should understand, you should not break it. You should really handle all these tubes very carefully and use it. Now, once you have all these set up, now you are ready for the measurement of this spectrum. So I given you an example, benzene phosphorescence here. And now once you freeze it, uh, if you don't use a phosphorimeter, phosphoroscope, you can even measure the fluorescence at low, room temp low, low temperature. That is also possible. Don't think that only at low temperature you can measure only for no. You change the mode from a phosphorescence to fluorescent mode. Yes, you can do this. So I given you a fluorescent spectrum of benzene also at liquid nitrogen temperature. If you go to the fluorescent phosphorescence mode, you can see that uh, you can measure the phosphorescence. And you can also remove, when you are measuring in a fluorescent mode, both you can record it. If you are going to the phosphorescence mode, your fluorescence will not come as a spectrum because you are going for a, a time where you can really cut all your fluorescence. Your fluorescence is dying off from your sample. So you are measuring only the phosphorescence, which is long lived when compared to the fluorescence. The, this is what is an important. You can measure the phosphorescence and fluorescence simultaneously at low temperature, or you can measure only phosphorescence also. This is the case I given you for benzene. So this is all possible by making use of your phosphoroscope and the low temperature accessory. Right. I'm taking another case, uh, benzophenone. <clears throat> benzophenone, I'm giving you an excitation spectrum, low temperature excitation spectrum. 
So this is the data recorded in a Hitachi machine, I think. Yes, Hitachi F7000. F now you can see the chopping frequency here. It is working at the frequency of 40 Hertz. Now you have the scan speed, almost like a 60 nanometer per minute. So you have the settings also, what kind of voltage you give for detector. So this is the excitation spectrum. Now it is your excitation spectrum. We know that when you record excitation spectrum, fix your emission wavelength and scan your excitation monochromator. This is the wavelength of the emission fixed at 444 and you can see that the excitation monochromator is scanning. And you can also record the phosphorescence. So when you go for a phosphorescence, fix your excitation monochromator, record your phosphorescence. You can see the a nice fingerprints of the vibrational modes of the benzophenone molecule. You can nicely see this. Again, uh, when you go for the settings of the machine, it is the same frequency. Now excitation is fixed at the 282 nanometer and your emission is scanning from almost like a 380 to 600 uh, nanometer. You can scan it. Now you can really see the uh, beautifully the excitation spectrum as well as the phosphorescence spectrum. And as say excitation, immediately you get an emission spectrum. Now we have to say the jargon excitation, phosphorescence excitation and phosphorescence spectrum. This is what is the difference. You will see it when you go for a low temperature measurements. So this is the way one can think of uh, using the phosphoroscope and then make a measurement of the phosphorescence at low temperatures. When I say phosphoroscope, it is the combination of the shutters or a pulse lamp, depending upon the machine that you have it. So once you understand the phosphorescence spectrum, when you want to go for a next parameter is your quantum million. So whenever you want to measure the quantum million, you should know that you have to have the corrected spectrum. There's no go. Whenever you want to measure the quantum million, whether it's a fluorescence or a phosphorescence, you need to have the corrected spectrum. Even the phosphorescence has to be corrected. Right now you can see that the, once you have the correction facilities, corrected phosphorescence spectrum, you can go for the quantum yield measurements. So in order to recall what we have studied about quantum yield, so we know that in terms of rate loss, intrasystem, rate, intrasystem quantum efficiency, which is the Intersystem quantum efficiency is the rate ratio of the rate constants of intersystem and the other radiative and non-radiative rate constants from the singular state. And otherwise it is the KISC multiplied by tau s and phosphorescence quantum efficiency is equivalent to the it's all you know what process that happened. This is the process rate constants. It's a triplet deactivation, radiative deactivation, that is nothing but your phosphorescence. And then you have a non-radiative. What is the quantum efficiency of the triplet formation? Out of the yield of the phosphorescence, otherwise triplet state, from that, how much is the uh, yield of the fluorescence? That is the reason why you have to multiply these two fractions. So this is what is your quantum efficiency of the phosphorescence. This is what is your mathematical way of expressing it. How are you going to measure again? Is the intensity of the phosphorescence and the light given to these samples. That's a simple way of measuring the phosphorescence uh, quantum efficiency. Now, how do we do it? Uh, if it is a low temperature, you can measure in absolute way. And you can also make use of the relative methods as we discussed. Now, if I'm going for a solid, you know, you can even do it in an integrating sphere. It is also possible do the low temperature measurement in integrating sphere. You can make use of the integrating sphere. And as we discussed about the quantum efficiency measurement using the integrating sphere, you can measure without the sample and with the sample right through the right through your excitation wavelength, record the phosphorescence spectrum. That will give you an information. How much is the intensity of the incident light? And now you can see that this is without the sample. What is the peak you get it incident light? Once you, I keep the sample and I see that there is a decrease in the intensity of the scattering that shows you there is a 
there is an absorption of the light that is given. Now the difference between S0 and S1 gives you the number of photons absorbed and you see the S2 is emitting, you know, when you have, when you don't have the sample, it's flat and you have the sample phosphorescence is picking up. Now this is, you have to integrate over this peak and get the ratio. So here also you have to integrate and that gives you the intensity of light given, intensity of light absorbed. So once you can calculate the number of photons emitted, this is the integration of S2 peak, then you have the number of photons emitted. And recall it is a phosphorescence. So we are talking about phosphorescence emission at low temperature, liquid nitrogen temperature and using an integrating sphere. And this is what is an interesting, but it, to look at it, you know, you have to do a lot of, uh, you know, you have to take care of many things and make a measurement. That's important. And then you are talking about the intensity of a light absorbed. It is a difference between S0 and S1. So number of photons given to the sample. So if you take the ratio, that gives you the quantum efficiency of the phosphorus. This is the way one measures the quantum efficiency of the phosphorus materials at low temperature, that is 77 Kelvin, making use of the integrating sphere. So that's a nice way to do it. And next is to measure the phosphorescence lifetime. We know what is the lifetime is and, and how do we do that is now, I, as I told you, we have to give a pulse of light. I make use of the pulse light and give it. And with this, is a, there's a time delay. I set it to measurement of the time. And now this is the gating, gating principle. I get this window over a period of time. I get it and see what is happening to the phosphorus and the intensity in this. I take the integration of the entire, you see that there is a slow decay of the phosphorescence. If I take a single point measurement, you always end up in error. So you take an average of this, that is what is called the averaging window and then plot uh, uh, intensity versus time. You can see that the plot is here on the right side. It gives you a intensity decay of the phosphorescence with reference to time. You can go on up to few seconds if it is long lived. Now this phosphorescence I've given you is something like a 800, a 759, uh, uh, otherwise 0.8 millisecond and this is what is the interesting thing to look at it. So you can measure the lifetime also. Now it is possible to do a phosphorescence spectrum, phosphorescence quantum efficiency and phosphorescence lifetime in the same fluorimeter. Whereas when you go for a fluorescence lifetime, it is not possible in a normal fluorimeter. But now people have made it, you know, it is, you can even do a TCSPC right into the spectrum fluorimeter, but it's a different device altogether. Now, because of the technology, they have integrated both also. If someone has a larger money, you can buy both together also. But it's always good to have an independent machine. You know, it's always if one fails, other may work. So you can think of independent machines. So here in the phosphorescence lifetime, it is possible to measure it in a spectrum. You can even do this phosphorescence in a flash photolysis, which we'll be discussing it later. If you learn on photochemistry, probably it all depends on how you show up interest and learn about flash photolysis in the photochemistry exercises. So you can do a phosphorescence right into the flash photolysis also. Um, again, uh, room temperature, uh, you know, frozen conditions like a 77 Kelvin is it possible. So this is how you make use of a spectrofluorimeter uh, by combination of a phosphoroscope to measure the phosphorescence parameters like a phosphorescence spectrum phosphorescence efficiency and phosphorescence lifetime. These are the three basic parameters one would look for it. And if you want, you can do a phosphorescence excitation spectrum also. Right. Now I've given you some data, which is a old data, you know, recorded long time back, you know, olden story even before I born. So naphthalene, uh, Naphthalene data is available 2.6. So it is, you can see that as you look at the different substitution on the naphthalene, how lifetime changes. They made analysis on this. So as you go for a heavier atom, the lifetime is also longer. And you can also see the how quantum efficiency is also changing. So you can see the nice behavior of the molecules. And that is analysis one can make it. Now, you know, we have, a lot of bases have been studied. You can think of uh, designing a material for application. That's where the this current scenario of the science stands. Now, when you go for the phosphorus measurements, what are the parameters in the molecule would influence or the conditions that would influence the phosphorus measurements? 
Number one is the spin orbital coupling. This is a very important parameter that will happen in the molecule. You can also influence it, influence the external additives by adding a heavy atom materials. And oxygen is also important. Temperature is important. We already seen it when, unless you measure at lower temperature, you may not be able to see the phosphorescence. Why you are going for a lower temperature is basically uh, freeze all the thermal deactivations and make the uh, population in the triplet state increase or enhance the observable populations in the phosphorescent states and that is the reason why we are always going for a liquid nitrogen temperature. Now oxygen is another molecule which will be interesting to look at it oxygen we will discuss and what exactly role played by oxygen. So let us go one by one let us start with the spin orbital coupling. So you should understand your spectroscopic principles so spin and orbital coupling when it does it what really happens you have the selection rule spin selection rule is breaking that is what is an interesting phenomenon now we know the singlet to triplet is forbidden process in the normal conditions when you have the spin orbital coupling there is a possibility of a singlet to triplet transition taking place there's a breaking of the selection rule so this happens when do you see a spin orbital coupling in a molecule when you have the large number of the electrons otherwise when you have the heavier elements present in your molecule. So there is a possibility of this spin orbital coupling. This influence also you call it like a heavy atom effect. So I, I see that Jainti has already joined the class. She has done some work on the heavy atom effect in her PhD and how exactly electron transfer is getting influenced and the products are changing when you have the heavy atom effect. Now you can see the spin orbital coupling. Now, when you look at the spin orbital coupling, you can see that intersystem processing will happen, right? So more intersystem processing will happen. Otherwise, you will see the larger amount of the phosphorescence happening. If someone wants to have the more phosphorescence, you always go for a heavier atom into the molecule. So that will give you more phosphorescence yield and in turn, it will decrease your fluorescence yield also. And otherwise, you can see that the transition, sometimes you can see the absorption itself singlet to triplet absorption you can directly see it also otherwise in general it enhances the singlet to triplet population and otherwise it increases the quantum efficiency of the phosphorescence this is very important when you have the more quantum efficiency of the triplet you will also see that the more quantum efficiency of the phosphorescence and as i told you it will also increase your relaxation so a triplet to the ground state that will also happen it is again a spin forbidden process that will also get influenced so that that way you can see the more uh, radiation less transition happening it so when you have more radiation less transition happening it you will see the more phosphorescence intensity coming up so that is the way you can see that it is doing a dual role increasing the population of the triplet states and also increasing the emission of your phosphorescence so it is uh, destroying your uh, non-radiative mode of the relaxation along with the phosphorescence so that is what is an interesting thing to happen when you have the heavier elements which is called the spin orbital coupling now what really happens you can do the spin orbital coupling having a atomic number of atoms in your material for example if i have the chelate complexes with organic materials you can have the different kind of uh, metals like aluminium scandium yttrium or lanthanide materials or heavier third row elements so you can think of many as you increase the atomic number you can see that the phosphorescence quantum efficiency is changing you can see the ratio between the phosphorescence quantum yield and fluorescence quantum it is increasing it and also phosphorescence lifetime will decrease because you know you are shortening the lifetime because you are relaxing faster also that is what is interesting thing you can see it when you have this spin orbital coupling otherwise it is called the heavy atom effect now you can put this heavy atom effect in a two ways also right so you can also see that instead of uh, taking a complex you can see this uh, I, this example i already given you but now the table is little enlarged with more data points uh, naphthalene with the uh, different substitutions flu fluoro chloro bromo iodo you can see the quantum efficiency of fluorescence is decreasing and you can see the quantum efficiency of the phosphorescence is increasing. You can see the lifetime of the triplet is decreasing. That is what is happening when you make a heavy atom elements 
right into the molecule like a naphthalene. So this is a trend mostly observed for all the organic molecules. Even the complexes that you make it, the same behavior you will see. It. So that is what is an interesting behavior of the heavy atom. Now this heavy atom, you can call it, it can be a, a you know, you can have it inside the material or outside the material. So it is called as an intrinsic or extrinsic. My, my slides are moving in a date. I don't know what's the problem. Okay, fine. Right. So you have the two types of uh, heavy atom. So it is called as a, it can be external or internal. You call them as internal heavy atom or external heavy atom effect or you call them as an intrinsic heavy atom effect or extrinsic heavy atom effect. Now it really makes you to have the more uh, spin triplet uh, transition. So that is what is relaxation of the spin states and that is otherwise breaking down the spin selection rule. So you can see the singlet to triplet transitions happening in the presence of heavier elements. So that is what is happening in the presence of heavier element. This is the role of the spin orbital coupling. Now next is our oxygen. Now what is the oxygen? We know that oxygen is paramagnetic and because uh, it has two unpaired electrons. So you have the spin multiplicity of the molecular oxygen is also a spin triplet. So many of them would not have spent your knowledge or understood this clearly. You have to look at your, this is very important and you have to see your energy level diagram of the oxygen this is if you look at it very carefully you have the two uncoded electrons so this is what is deciding now the oxygen that we are inhaling is a paramagnetic you know many times i have seen it when you ask this question to students they say it is diamagnetic you know in terms of electrons it may look like it's diamagnetic but in principle how exactly it fill up the molecular orbitals you see the number of uncoded electrons is two and the spin multiplicity is a triplet. So ground state of oxygen is a triplet. Now, when you have the solutions that you make it as the oxygen, if you are populating a triplet state, your triplet of the molecule and triplet oxygen will interact. So because it's a spin allowed process. So what it is interacting, otherwise it will react also. So what kind of a reaction it will do it? You have an energy transfer process. You can see that nicely your triplet state can transfer the energy to the oxygen. So it molecule will come down to the ground state and your triplet state of oxygen, you know, it is basically spectroscopically, we write like a triplet sigma G state and that will go to a singlet, singlet oxygen. You can see that when it is energy is transferred and you will reach a higher energy level. So which is a singlet state and you are also higher energy level of singlet, which is S2 state. So you can see that how much energy you're transferring will really make this watt state is getting populated. So you have the singlet state and triplet oxygen, singlet oxygen. Singlet oxygen is interesting because it is highly energetic. It can do an oxygen addition. If you have a double bond, you can have a singlet oxygen adding up across the double bond. It can even do a, a really kill, you know, you are unwanted. In fact, you know, it is, is the principle they make use of it in the cancer treatment it is called the photodynamic therapy and our singlet oxygen is an important molecule how to produce them produce the singlet oxygen is with the triplet sensitizer so you have a triplet state of the molecule it can transfer the energy you do a nice uh, singlet oxygen production singlet oxygen is very very important for all this uh, photodynamic treatment energy wise if you see it the energy difference between the triplet to a singlet oxygen about 0.97 electron volt and from a, the triplet oxygen of the ground state to the singlet oxygen second excited state is about 1.63 electron volt. Now you see the what's the orientation of the electrons. So here is a triplet. This is a singlet. There is a pairing of energy. Now you can see that pairing two different energy levels. That's the orient. What is simply doing is it is changing the electron spin orientation. You know that pairing needs an extra energy. So it supplies the pairing energy and that is what is done from a triplet state to the molecular uh, tri oxygen triplet state. And that is what is a 
oxygen quenching of the triplet state. So this is the way you can see the oxygen can react with the triplet state of the molecule. The third point that we said was the temperature can do a lot of role. Now temperature, what we are doing it for the phosphorus measurement, mostly, you know, they initially thought that when the early science was growing it, this luminescence science was growing, they thought that phosphorus can be done only at the a lower temperature. So most of the phosphorescence data, if you see, they are always done with the 77 Kelvin. At a later stage, only they could realize how to make the population when they understood the heavy atom effect very clearly and the inorganic complexes. So they really could see the luminescence happening at uh, room temperature. Earlier also, they had a molecule biacetyl was showing a very good phosphorescence at uh, room temperature, but they could not proceed with the more number of materials. Now, if you see the material science, uh, luminescent materials, phosphorescent materials and room temperature, they are large in number. Now, the question we ask, can we do a phosphorescence measurement at room temperature? Otherwise, can we observe the phosphorescence at room temperature? The answer is yes. So, how do we do that? That's the question. Now, there are methods to do it. What kind of methods will follow it? Now, you can have a solid support. See, when you make the solid support, when, it, when you're freezing it, what's happening, you're almost solidifying your samples. When you put your material on a solid support, what kind of a solid support? You can even think of a filter paper. Put your molecule in a filter paper or put it on a silica powder put it on a polymer matrix so you can really take any kind of a solid support which can really uh, make the unwanted uh, non-radiative deactivation negligible so you can think of a phosphorescence measurement you can see a room temperature phosphorescence or think of an organized assembly organized assembly like micelles cyclodextrin cavities if you put your molecules into the micelles or to cyclodextrin cavity it is possible to observe the phosphorescence at room temperature or alternatively you can think of adding heavier atoms potassium iodide silver lead thallium etc all these metals are heavier ions like iodide can really make the spin orbital coupling heavy atom effect and give you more yield either you change the matrix are increasing the population of the triplet state by adding a spin orbital coupling phenomenon. And the important thing, you must remove oxygen. If you have the oxygen, all your triplets will react. So this is very, very important. You take all these materials, remove oxygen, or put your spin orbital coupling, remove oxygen. Then it is possible to measure the room temperature phosphorescence. So it is you know, abbreviated as a RTP, it's called the room temperature phosphorescence. It's a very interesting behavior in terms of analytical application. It becomes very, it is now already popular in the luminescent measurements and phosphorescent measurements. A lot of application in analytical chemistry, that's what I would say it. And those who are interested in the analysis, quantification, estimation, not only in analysis, biology, you can see all these phosphorescence can happen and this is what is an interesting behavior are you hearing me okay wait. you're all silent so i thought okay room temperature phosphorescence as we said it is finding a lot of application so that's the reason i'm highlighting it so you can do wonders. Those who want to take up a lot of uh, new material science, and you can really play with this. You don't have to go for a liquid nitrogen. You need only the phosphorimetry. That's all. So uh, applications are quite large in number. If you see it, analysis of coal tar. So they can identify the impurities using the phosphorescent methods. Analysis of petroleum products. Analysis of polymer inhibitors. Analysis of pharma, you know, in fact, drugs, drug industries are using uh, low room temperature phosphorescence extensively to identify the product. You can even combine with the liquid chromatography and combine, detect it. Analysis of food and related products, yes. Another interesting aspect, 
is the paint industry blow paints you can even paint your house internal as well as external with the password materials in fact now in japan it is very popular they have a glowing houses and they daytime you know they absorb all the photons night time they emit light you know the houses look like you know light emission you know the glow paints in fact you know they use it on a road marking paints and other applications wherever it is possible they use it and the arts that you make it you know if you beautifully make uh, those who are interested in painting you can combine the phosphor materials and then you can see they can glow it and you can also use it for a forensic analysis My analysis is still mistake so forensic analysis you can also have the toys with a glowing light it's called the glow toys important uh, the password screens you know earlier even before the lcds we were using it they were using a password screens so computer screens or your television screens and some of the uh, devices still using the <coughs> password screens like your electron microscope and all that devices they make use of the password screens so you can think of using these materials in password screen it does not stop there if you can go one step forward you can think of designing a electroluminescent material so now so far what we are talking about is a phosphorescent material based on the photon it's called a photoluminescence if you can really make your materials many of them will have a redox couple so if you can design a redox couples in your molecular materials and that is where you have all your luminescent devices these are the materials coming up in your screens of the televisions now or your oled screens organic light emitting diode they are all based on the principle of electroluminescence the basis is the photoluminescence so they study the photoluminescence and then extensively understand the luminescent materials look at any display devices that you see it they are all based on the phosphorescence and room temperature phosphor materials mostly of transition metals third row or second row transition metal they use it not organic is also coming up organic oleds they call it but they have uh, you know their own difficulties but uh, inorganics are very popular in the display devices so now you know they are also working on a quantum dots so they that's what they call it like a qleds now you see that samsung is making a qled televisions they are all based on the luminescent devices which all happen at room temperature this is where uh, you have a lot of application towards the material science and technology and that is, the basis for that is coming from the phosphorescence so this is where we will end our session on the phosphorescence i really covered to summarize it i given you a basics of the phosphorescence how to measure phosphorescence in a spectrofluorimeter making use of a phosphoroscope and how to really design different kinds of the phosphoroscopes different companies make different types of the phosphoroscopes and how to use them for to record the phosphorescence spectrum phosphorescence quantum meal and when you want to go for a phosphorescence quantum meal always integrate with the integrating sphere or uh, attach an integrating sphere and then you can think of measuring the phosphorescence lifetime and then go for the application aspects where you have to think of the introducing spin orbital coupling introducing your uh, removal of oxygen from the system then you can see the extensive application of the materials see how it can be done there are uh, some ways you know if you don't have the oxygen if you don't want oxygen there are chemical sulfite materials they always add it the sulfites are reactive towards oxygen they remove the oxygen so uh, they can also in uh, a material tuning if you understand material science you can see that tune the material so that you can see more phosphorescence efficiency so, so you can have the heavy atom influencer and also the oxygen killer into the material you can have a beautiful phosphorescence happening right so one of the well known uh, phosphor materials they use it in a glow toys is strontium aluminate strontium nicely glows and they really mix it now it's very cheap actually you can buy it you can also play with the toys you can make your own uh, glowing toys you can make your own glowing paints those who are interested in uh, in paints wall paints screen paints glass painting you can mix your phosphor materials you can see the nicely they absorb light they can